Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Um, up to this point, I was discussing representation theory of mostly finite groups, so with the complex numbers. And now I would like to switch gears a little bit, and I would like to go to representations of finite monoids, or just representations of monoids. And this is a bit of a tricky subject, not because it's really tricky, but just because it's not as well known as, well, group theory or uh, well, representation theory of groups. So I first would like to just explain kind of what to expect, and then um, you should keep that in mind. And then in the next few videos, we will go on and discover a little bit more about representation theory of monoids. And the problem I'm facing is that representation theory of monoids, I hope to convince you in the in the, this video and the following videos, is actually pretty good and pretty smooth, surprisingly smooth, uh, but it's not as well known as representation theory of groups. Okay, not quite sure why, but also the theory of monoids is not as well known as the theory of groups. So a lot of people, I kind of can assume that most of you have seen a little bit about groups. Um, whether you have seen a lot about monoids is a very different question. I would expect no. So I have never seen any reasonable treatment of monoids while I was a student, which I admit is ages ago, but that's a different question. Oh, well, that's a different point here. Um, so anyway, so apparently that's not as much studied as theory of groups, but it's not much harder. So I don't quite know why monoids are not as popular as groups. In some sense, monoids are way closer to life and groups are a little bit way more random. Um, so I, I can't quite tell you why monoids are less studied than groups, because of course, every group is a monoid. We'll, we'll uh, see that in a second. That kind of the theory of them is not as studied. So before I can really go to representation theory of monoids, I kind of need to re recall, explain whatever, a little bit about uh, the theory of monoids without referring to any representations. And well, I just would like you to keep in mind where we want to go because it's actually pretty nice and I'm going to try to motivate this in this video. So I say it again, kind of my problem is uh, didactically speaking from my exposition and I can't assume that people know what the theory of monoids is. Most people probably wouldn't, um, including myself not very long ago. While, well, obviously not everyone knows what a group is or what the theory of group is, which is totally fine, but kind of may more people do actually. So in mathematics, the theory of groups is kind of everywhere and people like it and group actions and group representations. While monoids, it's literally the same. I'm trying to explain that, as I said, in the this video and the following videos, but it's certainly not as popular. And I don't really know why. So all the results about representation theory of groups are also, for example, very, very old. They're mostly due to Frobenius and students. So roughly about 120 years ago, while representation theory of monoids is also very, very classical, mostly goes back to the 50s, 40s, 60s of the last century. That was a great order. Let me try again. 40s, 50s, 60s of the last century. So it's still classical, but it's not as classical as representation theory of groups. So I really don't know why it's not as popular, as famous. It's still very, very smooth, and I hope you will like it because I like it a lot. But now let's get started after this uh, very, very long, way too long introduction. And well, so what is a monoid actually? So I like this picture a lot. I stole it from um, Mathematica. I stole it from Mathematica. I stole it from Wikipedia. Um, so it kind of illustrates the basic structures you can have on a set. So kind of the, the most basic one is just a magma, which is just the multiplications, a priori satisfying nothing. That's not really useful. Just having a multiplication that satisfies nothing is not uh, super exciting. And this kind of, well, this hypercube, this cube, it's not a hypercube, it's cube, kind of illustrates how you can go from a magma to the one with the most structure, which is a group. So the green arrows to the side is you add associativity, which is extremely important to, well, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, the red arrow to this side is you add inverses. So this is adding inverses, so A inverse, for example. And the blue arrow to the bottom is adding identities. So plus one adding an identity. So adding identity is pretty harmless. So you could kind of ignore the blue arrows and you could kind of collapse it along the blue arrows. Uh, adding divisibility, so the red arrows, is extremely crucial. That's kind of the point of, the, of this whole video. And the green arrows, well, the green arrows are also very crucial. Without the green arrows, I can't tell you anything. So basically what I want to say is that this little red box here down here, 
which is a part of the cube where associativity holds, this is a part where we have a good chance of a matrix representation, right? So we want to find a, a map from those guys, whatever they are, groups, monoids, semi-groups, blah, 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 to matrices and matrices are associative. So without associativity, it's unclear what you can say. So in this, well, it's now green. In this greenish corner, it's kind of unclear how matrix representation should look like, while in this red corner, uh, th th there should be really nice matrix representations. So for all of these, there should be very nice matrix representations. And I'm trying to explain that the real difference between all of these in the in the uh, right, what is it? The southeast corner is the red arrow, the invertibility, the divisibility, whatever. And the difference between, well, let's say semi-groups and monoids is kind of, kind of the same anyway. So um, in the literature, you'll often find semi-groups because it's a bit more general, but kind of adjoining ad ad identities is for free. So I, I, don't, I don't want to make a difference here. So a monoid is just like a group without invertibility. So that's the whole point. And because we have associativity, we should kind of expect to have a nice representation theory. And the real difference that I'm going to explain is is between this guy and this guy. And so far we are focused on this one. So we should ask the question, what about, what about the monoids, right? So as I said, I would like to collapse the blue arrows anyway, so I don't care for the difference. Everything to the uh, Northwest is probably way too crazy and we can't say anything reasonable. So there are only two cases left, the groups and the monoids. And say we already understand the groups reasonably well, so we should study monoids. Um, an example of a monoid, which is not a group, would be the natural numbers with addition, because you don't have any inverses, right? You can't subtract. So you don't have a minus, minus five. And that's the whole point. So in a monoid, you don't need to have inverses. Okay. And the point is a little bit, at least for me, that groups are kind of a bit of a random object. So what I did here, so uh, linked to the description, um, the online integer sequence, uh, you can list the number of groups and you can list the number of monoids. I decided to not quite list the number of monoids up to isomorphism, but this list was slightly nicer. So I also collapse them if they're anti-isomorphic, uh, which is the same anyway. But anyway, forget it. Um, the, so I have here the number of groups up to isomorphism of order and then the number of monoids. And I decided to plot those in Mathematica. And this is how it looked like. I decided to do a log plot because they're really just, so if you don't log plot it, there are huge spikes. So the group picture up to thousand will look a little bit like this. There are two spikes and everything else is basically around zero. Uh, so these are the groups up to 1000. And this is the monoids up to 10 because this list or 11 or whatever, because this list only goes to 10 or 11. And you can clearly see a difference here. And this is kind of a general, I'm not sure whether this is really proven or it's just an empirical observation. I would guess it's, a, it's the latter. It's just an empirical observation. But groups kind of go up and down. They're, they're completely crazy. They appear completely randomly. Uh, the number of groups is just a horrible sequence. It goes down to one, up to two, up to five, up to 12, up to one million, and down to one again. It's it's completely crazy. So here in my log plot, you can kind of see it. It looks like a starry, starry night or something. <laughs> I have no idea. It goes up and down. It's, it's, completely, it's completely random. While uh, the monoids are way better behaved. They have this, they're just more and more and more and more and more of them. And they are really meant much, much more. So here, the groups of order eight, you have five groups of order eight, five different groups of order eight. So let's have a look at the monoids of order eight. Um, so, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are quite a few of them, <laughs> not just five, many, many more. So they have many, many, many more monoids than groups. Okay, so kind of you, and groups, or any group is a monoid, of course. Um, so groups are very special. That's what I want to say here. <laughs> just it was for a very long waffle to just saying groups are very special, but monoids are way more kind of generic, if you want. So groups are very special, and we know that they have a nice representation theory. And maybe because they are very special, they have a nice representation theory. So groups are kind of like a little bit very, very, very special objects. And monoids are very different. Kind of in nature, they're a minimal generalization, but there are zillions of them. They behave way more generically in some sense, at least when it comes to numbers. There's almost no structure you can play around with. And it seems to be absolutely unclear from this perspective why monoid representation theory has any chance to be nice, right? So there's zillions of examples, in particular, there's zillions of counterexamples. Um, so why on earth is this any better than general representation theory of general objects? 
which is not really which is not really nice in general, right? So groups, well, probably nice because they are very, very special objects. Monoids, I don't know. They're not so special, they're just everywhere. And maybe you just can't say anything about them. And that's the reason why representation theory is not as popular of them as for groups. But turns out it's it's really, really not so bad. It's surprisingly nice keeping those numbers in mind. Right? Just comparing the number five to this number here. Uh, yeah, so most monoids are not groups. That's, that's kind of what it's saying. So it's, it's absolutely unclear why there should be any satisfying theory. But there is, right? Spoiler. Otherwise, I wouldn't make those videos, obviously. There is. And I really like that. It, it, it's, it's almost as nice as group representation theory, just a bit harder, just a little bit harder. I will see what that means, actually. And kind of the idea is the following. So monoids are more like life. So in life, I just can't undo what I've done wrong. I would like to undo my mistakes. I've done so many mistakes in my life. I've done so much crap in my life. I would be really happy to undo. I just undo everything. Uh, but I don't have an undo operation in a, in a, in a monoid. I, I can't undo my multiplication because elements are not invertible. So um, in a group, this is very different, right? So group is very different from life. You could just, okay, if you do G, you just do G inverse and you're back to where you started. Well, fine. That would be great, right? Like, like, oh, I've done a mistake. I just invert my mistake and I'm, I'm back to where I started. Yeah. Uh, anyway, more is more like life. And um, kind of the slogan I want to sell in the next few videos is kind of multiplication in the group kind of preserves information. We can always go back. There's no loss. While multiplication in the so uh, in the monoid is really lost the data, so it really destroys information in general. And turns out that the really crucial uh, ingredient in monoid theory is to measure this information loss in the multiplication, which is done by the green cells, which I'm going to capture in the next video. And that's the slogan that you should keep in mind: monoid destroys information. Green cells measure the information loss. So green cells should play a huge role in the representation theory of monoids. And indeed, they will. And kind of the slogan is, in the end, so a theorem which is very hard to nail down precisely. It appears in, in, in three papers, at least, roughly starting in the 1940s, then 1950s. Basically, the representation theory of a monoid is controlled by its maximal subgroups. So basically, representation theory of a monoid is representation theory of groups. And the maximal subgroups themselves arrange themselves uh, according to the green cells. So we have pictures like this. And there's an information loss that goes in one direction. And kind of the groups kind of sit in, in one of those information pictures. And you get a blockwise decomposition of the representation theory of a monoid according to the groups of equal information. And uh, that's the whole essence of the representation theory of, of monoids, which I'm going to explain. So it's, it's basically, that's what I said, it's basically group representation theory plus measuring information loss. I'm, that's pretty cool, actually. That's actually pretty cool. By the way, I am very far up. So if you want to think of life as such a picture as well, like um, <laughs> going a very, very long chain of those guys, maybe not a chain, but a crazy post set of those guys, um, which, which you go up and up and up, and the more mistakes you do, I, I'm very far up in this, in this ladder. And you can't go back anymore. As soon as you've done a mistake, it's done. And that's exactly the same pattern here. So as soon as you've done a mistake, you, you kind of jump upwards and you, you, can, you can never jump backwards. You can always just jump upwards. You can do more mistakes. You can't undo your mistakes. Anyway, <laughs> so what I wanted to say is basically representation theory of monoids is representation theory of groups plus measuring information loss. And I will make this precise in the following videos. That's, I just want to keep, uh, that's what you should keep in mind while we're discussing a little bit about the theory of monoids himself. Anyway, let me wrap up by really saying what I mean by monoids are semi-groups. So if you like this uh, this picture, which is certainly nuking a fly, but still I like it. I, I like to nuke flies. So um, so there's a there's a category of monoids. So my little bubble here on the right, whatever category is, doesn't really matter. There's a category of semi-groups, my little bubble here on uh, the right. The other one was on the left, not on the right. But anyway, so monoids on the left, semi-groups on the right. And every monoid is a semi-group. It's really just the same. Semi-groups don't necessarily need to have identities, which brings me to the point that the name semi-group is a little bit silly. It should be called semi-monoid. Anyway, so semi-groups, same as monoids, but without necessarily having groups. 
uh, sorry, uh, a unit. So you can always just consider a monoid as a semi-group by just forgetting that it, that it has a unit. It still has a unit, but you, you don't remember it anymore. So you get an inclusion of categories if you want. So you can always associate every monoid to a semi-group. And this inclusion has a natural uh, adjoint, which is the adjoining identity. And I've just written down how that works in, in case you wonder. But basically what it says is my new, so this is, as I said, this is really nuking your fly. I'm using here the adjoint functor theorem. Anyway, so that's definitely nuking your fly. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying here is adjoining units is free, comes for free in a very, very general and very, very natural sense, if you want. So you kind of can forget about the difference between monoids and semi-groups. Um, the most of the literature, the semi-groups, because then you just have the abstract uh, theory, theory anyway, and it's not really any difference. Um, I like to stay with the monoids for these expositional videos because it's just slightly easier. And as I said, there is just no difference or not, not any real difference. So um, you can always, in some universal way, adjoin an identity. So difference between monoids and semi -group. Anyway, this was way too much raffle. Uh, so let me just uh, jump on to my last slide. My last slide is, well, this one, as usual. And I just want to say, re recall again, that what I'm going to try to explain in the next few videos, um, please don't lose track, or I hope, hopefully you won't, is that representation theory of monoids is surprisingly smooth keeping in mind how many monoids you have compared to groups. And it's basically representation theory of groups together with the information loss ordering on the monoid multiplication. And that's about it. Uh, obviously, th there's a little bit more to it, but kind of that's the main slogan and that's the main slogan I would like to sell. Anyway, I hope you liked this video and I also hope to see you next time.